Hello, my name is Barry Lacey and I'm the Historian Residence for Wexford County Council. And today I'm going to be discussing with you the railways in County Wexford's revolutionary period from 1916 through to 1923, encompassing the 1916 Rising, War of Independence and the Civil War. Now, before I discuss the role of Wexford Railways during the revolutionary period, it's important to place everything into context. In the early part of the 20th century, County Wexford was well served by the railway, as you can see by the map on the left hand side of the screen, which shows the extensive network which once existed in the early 20th century. Its first station opened at Ballywilliam, which you can see on the right hand side, in 1862, and this was situated along a line which ran from Baglingstown in County Carlow to Macmine, where it would later form a junction with the Dublin to Rosslare line. At Palace East, between Belly William and Macmine, another line branched off towards Watford via New Ross, while at the south of the county, another line linked Rosslare Port with Watford City. At a time when motor cars were few for many, the train would have been a primary mode of transport and also came with an economic benefit, linking the county's towns and villages to Dublin, Watford and elsewhere. In particular, the creation of a port at Rosslare provided an international dimension for both passengers and goods. During the 1916 Rising, the importance of Wexford's railway network was obvious to the leaders in Dublin. Paul Galligan, who had been in the city at the start of the Rising, returned to Wexford with direct orders from James Connolly to mobilise the Inniscorthy Battalion and hold the railway line to prevent the movement of troops from Rosslare. The volunteers did as ordered, and the rails were disconnected north of Inniscorthy at Carrick Foil, and an attempt was made to blow up the railway bridge over the Borough River at Edermine, only causing minor damage, but enough to slow a train's progress. Likewise, an attempt was made to blow up the Moyen Bridge, but this failed. During the Rising, Ferns Village was also taken over by a group of volunteers, and they took up the railway tracks and dismantled the signals along the line that ran just outside the village. Meanwhile, a munitions train that ran daily from Wexford to Kynox Munitions Factory in Arklow was stopped and commandeered at Inniscorthy Town. During the War of Independence, the IRA undertook frequent raids on mail trains throughout the county. This formed part of intelligence gathering operations where correspondence from police and military was checked. Francis Carty, in his witness statement given to the Bureau of Military History several decades after such events, described the sort of information gathered from these operations. He goes on, on to say, the mails yielded a certain amount of routine correspondence from RIC head constables in different parts of the county. This gave us information regarding the strength of each RIC barracks, and the patrol duties undertaken. We also obtained a considerable number of letters from black and tan members of the RIC, which were going to the relatives in England. The addresses of these men were sent to GHQ and I had the impression that certain actions were being taken at their homes in England and Wales. The effectiveness of their operations became apparent when references were made to letters written by black and tans to how they were confined to the safety of their barracks for most of the day and night. The robbery of eggs from local farmers, which appear to be in an abundant supply, is also referred to. Francis states, Letters from black and tan members of the RIC into Mum Barracks spoke of the dangerous position they were in as a result of barrack attacks. They stated that it was unsafe to venture far from the barracks by day or by night, and one of these letters compared conditions to the trench warfare in France during the First World War. To us, knowing that there was very little behind the attacks in question, these letters were amusing, but they did indicate the value of periodical sniping attacks on these military posts. A number of the letters spoke of eggs which these black and tans were sending to English relatives. They said that there was no limit to the amount of eggs they could send, provided they received a supply of egg boxes. The eggs were, of course, being stolen from the local farmers. He also describes an interesting practice where the mails were stamped or censored at random to give the impression of a much larger IRA operation than that, than that which actually existed. He states, I would go out with a rubber stamping machine and examine the mail bags. Civilian mails were not read. The envelopes were slit and outside were stamped, censored IRA. 
The int intention was to give the civilian population in the town the impression that the IRA was a more extensive, extensive organization than it was in fact. Many other rural stations were targeted during the raiding of mails, including in Ferns, Killorn, and Rackrogue. Sometimes the enthusiasm of the younger generations got in the way of operations, as Francis Carty recalled in his statement how in July 1921, the same train carrying mail was raided twice in the one night. The OC of the local FINA, the Boy Scouts of the IRA, didn't hold a high opinion of the capabilities of the local volunteers and argued that they, the FINA, should be allowed to engage in military operations. So one night, taking the initiative, the OC and his men stopped a goods train at Killorn, not knowing that it had just been held up earlier that same night by the members of the Crossbeg IRA. Another outcome from checking of mails was intercepting correspondence between um, any potential informers or spies with the authorities. One such case is referred to by James O'Toole in his witness statement, and it relates to the execution of two brothers near Boclody. A James Skeleton, aged 28, and his brother Thomas, aged 21. Both were accused of being spies after a letter addressed to Sergeant Torsney in Bunclody was intercepted from the raid of a mail train at Scar Welsh. The letter was found in a bag addressed to the district inspector in Inniscorty and informed the sergeant that arrangements were being made for one of the brothers to be taken into the RSC. A sum of money for both accompanied the letter. James couldn't recall the origin of the letter, only stating that it had been from the county inspector's office in Wexford, Ornstead, RICHQ in Dublin. The information was forwarded on to uh, IRA General Headquarters in Dublin and permission was given to execute the brothers. James attempts to dispose of any doubts surrounding the circumstances of the execution, stating how they had to be sanctioned by Dublin and that permission was only given, and I quote, after the guilt of the persons concerned had been proven beyond the slightest doubt. He recalled how the two brothers were taken away and told to make an act of the act of contrition and after having doing so um, were both shot. As well as the transportation of mail throughout the county, um, the trains also transported goods and this provided the IRA the opportunity to acquire much needed supplies and resources. Um, one such instance is on the 5th of June 1920 when up to 800 gallons of petrol were delivered to Inniscorty railway station. Um, due to its flammable nature, it was left stored in the railway wagon and not the good store. Um, and that night, between 90 and 100 men helped load the petrol into two lorries and it was taken away and stored in a safe location for use elsewhere. References also exist to how the IRA would take away steel shutters from trains which were bound to be delivered to various RIC barracks throughout the county which were being fortified due to the increase in tax by the IRA at the time. And in Kilnick in August 1920, um, when a mail train was stopped, an opportunity came about that the IRA made away with a motor bicycle belonging to the property of the Postmaster Master General. On the 11th of May 1921, the three o'clock Wexford to Dublin train was ambushed a short distance north of Killorn Station. And this is the only such instance of an attack on a train during the War of Independence in County Wexford. According to James Daly, in his witness statement given some years later to the Bureau of Military History, um, the target was a group of 10 soldiers accompanying an RAC sergeant who was delivering pay to the Devonshire Regiment stationed in the courthouse in Inniscorty town. During the attack, the firing only lasted a few minutes as the IRA quickly realised there were civilians on board and so called off the attack. No casualties were reported on either side, but one of the British soldiers sustained a slight wound to his hand. Earlier in April that same year, a similar operation had been planned at Camp Isle Station, where a party of military were supposed to come along on the water to Ross Bear train. However, when the IRA boarded, they found only a single auxiliary from Limerick who was dressed in civilian clothes. 
After identifying himself, he was led onto the platform and relieved of his revolver, ammunition, and some documents he had on his person. Contemporary newspaper accounts recalled how he was made swear never to return to Ireland and that a young lady pleaded with the men not to shoot him. Following the truce of July 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was later signed that year. And in the months that followed, debates took place countrywide, both for and against it, with many prominent speakers drawing huge crowds. On Sunday, the 11th of April 1922, Michael Collins was set to give such a speech in favour of the treaty in Wexford town, and it was understood he would make the journey from Dublin via a special train on the day. On the morning of the 11th, the train left the capital full of enthusiastic speakers ready to hear Michael Collins' speech. However, near Arklow, the morning inspection had found sleepers were removed from the line. And when railway workers attempted to repair it, they were confronted by armed and masked men who halted the work and flung their tools into the nearby Avoca River. The train was halted at Arklow, and after negotiations with the local IRA commander, the pickets were removed and the train allowed to continue along its journey. However, when it reached Inniscorty, the engine driver was kidnapped by armed men and taken away by motor car, and the train unfortunately failed to reach Wexford Town. However, it later transpired that Michael Collins had made the journey the day earlier, and he would later give his speech on the 11th of April 1922 in Wexford Town in favour of the treaty. The outbreak of civil war throughout the country in the summer of 1922 led to an explosion of activity in County Wexford. From July onwards, fighting broke out in Inniscorthy and Ferns, while in the preceding months, anti-treaty forces raged a guerrilla war against free state forces. The county as a whole saw more violence and death during this time than it did previously in the War of Independence, and the county's infrastructure suffered heavily with the deliberate destruction of its bridges, roads and buildings in a bid to disrupt the running of the newly established Free State. Railway bridges were destroyed, trains derailed and ambushes inflicted casualties, caused destruction and weakened morale for the National Army. On Monday afternoon, the 24th of July 1922, the bloodiest incident on Wexford railways occurred when the 4.20pm mail train travelling from Wexford to Dublin was ambushed at Killorn. The two carriages nearest the engine were occupied by Free State soldiers, while the third carriage held Republican prisoners, being transported to the capital Dublin. As the train exited the tunnel on the Wexford side of Killorn Station, it was fired upon by anti-treaty forces, Bob Lambert's Kyle Flying Column. News had previously reached Lambert and his men of the train's arrival, and they decided to use the opportunity to try and free their comrades aboard. Bob and his men, assisted by local common amon, were brought across the River Slaney by boat, as the movable bridge at Killorn had been raised. They laid railway sleepers across the line to act as a blockade and position themselves on a high embankment with woods overlooking the train. Lambert's men directed their fire at the carriages occupied by the Free State soldiers. Due to their carriage door being locked, the Free State soldiers were forced to try and escape through the windows. The engagement lasted for half an hour before the column retreated, cautiously aware of Free State forces arriving. The incident resulted in two Free State soldiers' deaths, Corporal Thomas McMahon and Private Morris Quirk, with seven others wounded. One of the latter, 17-year-old Michael Campion from Dublin, died of his wounds three days after the incident. The train was full of civilians at the time, but fortunately only a single passenger, Mr. Raymond O'Keefe received a slight wound to his arm. Following the ambush, the train continued on to McMine, and when it arrived, witnesses were greeted to the gruesome sight of running boards drenched in blood, which oozed from beneath the carriage doors. When it reached Inniscorthy, the driver John Sketch White was taken off and arrested on charge of colluding in the ambush. He had failed to follow the Free State Captain's request to drive the train to the safety of the station wall at Killorn stating that the brakes were jammed. However, after an inspection, this was found not to be true. The collaborator, though, was in fact one of the prisoners aboard, Francis Carty, who had become aware of their transportation to Dublin and alerted Bob Lambert. Subsequent arrangements had been made for the ambush, and Francis was given carriage keys by his mother, while friends and relatives said goodbye to the prisoners at Wexford Railway Station. 
He recalled, however, they, how they made no attempt to escape during the ambush for fear of getting caught in the crossfire. After the passengers aboard departed in escorty, the train continued on to Dublin, arriving late that night. When they eventually departed the train, all prisoners were lined up and shots fired on the ground in front of them. One of the prisoners was struck by a ricochet bullet, Richard Tyrrell from Cranford. He died in March 1925 at his home, after never fully recovering from the incident. During the Civil War, numerous railway stations and buildings suffered damage. In September 1922, Chapel Station was burned and this marked a new phase as explosives were becoming harder to come by for the anti-treaty forces. And so burnings followed in place of bridge explosions from July and August. A list of buildings destroyed can be seen in this blade on the screen. And the primary aim of this was to immobilize the railway by destroying its switching and signaling systems. According to Mr. Ford, inspector of the railways in Wexford, this failed as they never allowed enough time for the fire to cause damage to the frame of the signal cabins, and the blaze was always brought under control in time. As the Civil War progressed, obtaining explosives proved difficult for the anti-treaty side. The option of manufacturing it themselves proved too difficult and dangerous. Apart from the destruction of the Taylorstown viaduct, the raiders found it hard to and never did disrupt the running of the railways. As explosives were in short supply, attempts to disrupt communications were undertaken by cutting the telephone wires. This, however, also proved inefficient, as there was always a linesman patrol for every three and three quarter mile, and a line only took minutes to repair. They then proceeded to target the poles themselves, but the railway then used pilot working to accommodate the repair period. One of the most notable incidents of damage to a railway infrastructure in Wexford during the Civil War occurred in July 1922, when Taylorstown Viaduct, which carried the South Wexford line from Rosslare to Watford, was blown up. One arch was demolished in the explosion, with three others collapsing. It took a long time to repair, with the corked Rosslare trains working around by McMine Junction up to Christmas the following year. Another notable example was that of Bridge 367, as it was known, located just west of Palace East Station, where the two lines ran parallel to each other before separating towards New Ross and Bagnestown. The bridge crossed the New Ross to an escorty road and was blown up on Tuesday the 18th of July 1922. It was subsequently repaired with timber supports, but was burned a further 13 times. The last in January 1923, when the wood was finally replaced with steel girders instead. Additional supports were later added when they realised the initial repair wasn't sufficient to support passing trains. During the Civil War in County Wexford, there were numerous incidents of trains being destroyed and derailed by the anti-treaty forces. And we're going to discuss a couple of these incidents here now. One took place on the 15th of October 1922 when the Waterford morning train was stopped by raiders at Palace East. Here they unhooked the train from the engine and sent it back down the gradient where it came off the tracks. However, a team later made the necessary repairs and reinstated the train back on the tracks. In another incident on the 27th of January 1923, the Waterford mail train was held up and the engine unhooked and it was sent at full steam unattended. It flew through New Ross town before eventually coming to a halt on the Kilkenny side of New Ross. Again, fortunately in this incident nobody was injured either. However, on that same day, anti-treaty forces stopped another train a short distance before Caloran Station on the Dublin to Wexford line. Three Free State soldiers who were on board engaged the men with the revolvers and a firefight ensued with which um, resulted in one of the soldiers, Lieutenant Charles Burke from Dublin, being severely wounded. The train's fireman, Mr William O'Mahony, was also wounded in the legs. After the firing ceased, the passengers were ordered off the train and the wounded were brought to Caloran Station. Here the IRA arrested people on the platform who were three military in civilian clothes, a civic guard in plain clothes and also a civilian. Meanwhile, the two Free State soldiers who had been on the train were marched across fields, stripped of their uniforms and released. 
The passengers got back onto the train and with the IRA, it continued onto McMahon Junction, where the passengers were ordered off again and the train was sent loose up the line. At the first bridge, a rail had been disconnected in an attempt to derail the train, but it jumped the gap and continued past in Escorty before eventually coming to a halt near Camolan village. Back in McMahon, meanwhile, two passenger trains and a ballast train were set fire by the anti-treaty forces and they were burned and destroyed. In another incident on the 10th of July 1922, raiders blew up a bridge on the Wexford side of Killoran Station, which crossed a lane leading to Killoran Quay. No warning was given and the signals were left keep clear, and the 415 Wexford to Waterford goods train was to become the victim. Rails were broken short of the wreck bridge also. The engine, which was travelling at speed, miraculously managed to jump the gap and come to rest on the other side outside the rails. The wagons toppled over and the breakdown crew made the necessary repairs later on and miraculously the line was open again by half ten that night. In another incident on the 11th of November 1922, outside Killorn Station, raiders pulled the rails out of the edge of the embankment. The night's good train from Dublin was halted, its passengers taken off, and the train rolled down the bank. The engine ended up on its side in the River Slaney, just below Killoran Quay, and it was completely submerged at high tide. The repairmen could only work on it for two hours during low tide, and utilise the strength of every passing train that they could give it time to help speed up the process. Although disruption to the railways was much of a nuisance for many people during the Civil War, on one occasion, it actually benefited the locals in Killoran. On the 15th of August 1922, a goods train ran to a trap when rails had been removed from the Wexford end of Killoran Tunnel. It came out the other end and ended up on its side. Inspector Ford was quoted as saying, They, the locals, were demoralised and the amount of pilfering was disgraceful. You couldn't watch them. they take anything. They came with horses and carts from near and far. Besides the coal, there was a consignment of tea on the train, and £300 worth of drapery goods. For long afterwards, there was all the tea the countryside could use. Palace East was situated in a mountainous area, and Mr Ford, the railway inspector, described how it was always a nest of troubles, stating these mountainy folk were an awful law-breaking crowd, out for the loot and what they could get out of the troubles. When they held up a train, they took everything but the engine. What Mr Ford didn't realise, however, was that Palace House, on whose property Palace Station was located, was a centre of operations for the anti-treaty forces. The Free State soldiers later occupied the house in February 1923, and fast forward a month to March, and half a tonne consignment of salt was delivered by train to the house, addressed to a Mr Doyle, along with a bag addressed to Miss Kathleen Lynn of Palace House. It lay there for a week before the Free State garrison decided to help themselves after coincidentally running out of salt. However, they found half a tonne of potassium chloride which was used for bomb making instead, and it's safe to say that Mr Doyle never turned up for the salt. Although not directly linked with the railways, a tragic incident took place during the Civil War near Palace Station, connected with the Free State Garrison assigned to the station to protect it from attacks by anti-treaty forces. On Sunday morning, the 4th of March 1923, a pony and cart were discovered on the side of the road. Inside, in a pool of blood, lay the bodies of John and Margaret Hornick, both brother and sister. John was 25, while his sister was only 12. Both were the children of a well-known farmer from Kilgarvan to Munn, and they had set out the previous evening in a spring cart drawn by a pony, heading to their grandfather's residence, where they usually spent the weekend. In the subsequent inquest that followed, Free State soldier Private Phelan, who was on sentry duty at Palace East, described how he became aware of the cart after they passed the railway bridge. He called on them three times to halt, but after receiving no reply, he fired a warning shot into the air. The cart kept moving and he fired again, but this time aiming in its direction. It subsequently came to a halt, but he was refused permission to go inspect it by his superiors. The cart therefore wandered the countryside throughout the night and was found the next morning by passers-by several miles away. The medical evidence described how both victims had bullet wounds to the head. 
despite there only being one shot fired. Conflicting evidence was given in the inquiry, but the final verdict found that both victims died from bullet wounds inflicted by Private William Phelan, and that there were no warning shots fired. Although Wexford was one of the last counties in Ireland to obtain a railway, by the early 20th century it had an extensive network that served all of its major towns, as well as many rural villages and locations. Its significance in terms of transport from Lost Lair was realised during the 1916 Rising, when orders were given to hold the line to prevent the movement of troops from reaching Dublin. There was no disruption or damage to the railways as far as this author could ascertain that occurred during the War of Independence, which is in stark contrast to the situation during the Civil War. During the former period, the rail was reutilised by both sides for travel, and while the IRA wished to make life difficult for Crown forces, they didn't wish to disrupt the everyday life of the ordinary folk in the country. They did, however, make use of the railways by raiding mails and goods trains to obtain intelligence and resources. A single attack was recorded on a train late in the War of Independence in Sackleuren. The Civil War saw disruption and destruction to the railways across the county as the anti-treaty forces sought to make it impossible for the new free state government to function. Many of the Wexford railways, which had endured so much during these turbulent times, would eventually become redundant due to economic factors and the development of motor vehicles and improvements in roads. Today only the Dublin to Rosslare line sees regular traffic in a county which once had an extensive network and although the tracks are gone, the memories and legacy of the railways will be preserved in history for many years to come.